You know, we learned last week that um, one of God's great purposes when it comes to trials is to test our faith. Are we going to trust God or are we going to try to figure this thing out and fix it ourselves? We learned the week before that one of the great responses to trials is faith. And we learned that from the three uh, guys who got thrown in the furnace, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that they had a faith that told the king, King, you know what? I don't care what you do to us and I don't care what the outcome is. I want to continue to trust my God and worship him and obey him no matter what happens. We learned that was the kind of faith it takes to walk in trials, to trust God and even trust God with the outcomes. And if it's what I want or not, it's what he knows is best and brings him glory. Well, this morning I want to continue that line of faith and I, I want to talk about a story that God has used in my life on repeated occasions. It's in Second Chronicles, not Chronicles, but Chronicles, Jim, just in case you're wondering. Chapter 20 is the story of Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat was a king in Judah. And this story God has used over and over again in my life to give me bearings when I'm facing things in my life that are bigger that I'm strong and smarter than I'm smart. And I'm hoping that you'll catch some of that today as well. Now this is what happened. Jehoshaphat was there in Jerusalem and he just got a report that there's three nations that have come together and they're just 25 miles down the road and they're coming to make war with you, Jehoshaphat. They want to destroy you. And so Jehoshaphat was afraid. And we're going to learn in this story two great tools on how to respond in the middle of trials that are smarter than we're smart and bigger than we're st strong. And, that's, and this is the first one. We need to lock our eyes on Jesus. We need to lock our eyes on Jesus. If you're there, note what Jehoshaphat did as the first thing. Verse 3 of 2 Chronicles 20 says this. Jehoshaphat was afraid. And he turned his attention to seek the Lord. I love what this uh, literally says. It says he turned his face. And when he says he turned his face, he means he turned his attention. He turned his focus. He put it all on seeking the Lord. We, we, we see this constantly. Brought up my phone. And um, what happens? I, I could be sitting at home talking to my lovely bride, Kimberly Jean. And all of a sudden, I hear a little ding dong on my phone. What happens? I turn my face away from my wife. Hey, who just texted? Matter of fact, somebody texted me during the first service. I don't usually bring my phone up. Somebody texted me during I'm like, oh, who's that? Who's that? You know. But it, 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 we turn our face away. And so what Jehoshaphat did is that he took his attention off of the report he just heard and all the information and what's going on, and he turned his face to seek the Lord. He gave his full attention. He turned his attention away from the problem and he put his attention upon the Lord to seek God in the problem. And then it says in the next verse that all of Judah was called together and they were fasting and they were seeking the Lord for help in prayer. And then we see this prayer beginning in verse 6. And he said this. O oh Lord, the God of our fathers, are you not God in the heavens? And are you not ruler over all the kingdoms of the nations? Power and might are in your hand so that no one can stand against you. I don't know a better way to come to a problem and to all of a sudden, 
turn my face away from this big problem that I don't know what to do and I don't have the resources to fix it. And I turn my attention from the problem and I put it upon God. And the first thing I do is I see God in a proper perspective and I exalt him. And now all of a sudden I'm recognizing, guess what? My God is bigger than the problem. He's a ruler over all the nations, even those three nations that are coming against me. And he has power in his might, his hands, so nobody can stand against him. God, you're bigger than what three nations can bring against us. So all of a sudden, the problem is getting in perspective as he begins to pray, and he lifts up God and exalts him and gains his footing in the midst of the difficulty. And then we come down to verse 12 and we see the request. Oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we are powerless before this great multitude who are coming against us, nor do we know what to do. Now, after acknowledging how big God is, that God's bigger than the problem, now he's, he's being humble. <laughs> he's being honest. He's going to say, you know what, God? I'm powerless before this. This thing's bigger than me. I don't have what it takes. It's stronger than I'm strong. I can't fix it. And then he says, nor do we know what to do. God, we don't even know what to do. This is smarter than I'm smart. I can't figure it out. And so the first thing Jehoshaphat starts with is, is recognizing the reality of the size of the problem up here and recognizing his size and how unable and small he is to face it. But he says this, but our eyes are locked. No, I'm sorry, that's my sermon point, not my eyes, but our eyes are on you. He's saying, you know what? My eyes are locked on you, God. And you know, Jesus is my God. He's your God. But, you know, he's, Jesus said what? He looked to the Father because the Father was his head and everything in his life was initiated by the Father. Well, who's, who's our head? Jesus. He's our God. And so now I look to Jesus because he's the one that initiates in my life and I respond to him. And so what I got to do is I got to lock my eyes on Jesus. And you know, guys, this passage encourages me and I've literally been to it, I'll, I'll say thousands of times in my life. And you're gonna say, wait a minute, Pat. Are you telling me that you face over a thousand times problems that are that big? Um, no, but I will tell you this. When you understand what God's called me to in his word, all of a sudden I recognize that it's bigger than I'm smart and stronger than I can pull off. Because there are times we run into trials that are that big. So, but you know what? I love what Howard Hendricks said in seminary. Christians don't understand the Christian life. Because most of them think it's difficult. And what happens when you think it's difficult? I try a little bit harder. But when you realize the Christian life is impossible, guess what? <laughs> I stop trying and I start trusting in Jesus. Because you know what this Bible calls me to do? Every day my life is to be a miracle. Every day my life is to be a life where Jesus is living his life through me. I'm not called to live for Jesus. I'm called to yield to Jesus to live through me. And I'm called to love my wife as Christ loved the church. I'm called to be patient with those who wrong me. I'm called to love my enemies and pray for them. I'm, you know, I'm called, the list goes on and on. So here's the real, the truth I'm talking about today applies to our entire life because every moment as I walk, God tells me not to walk in Pat's own strength and Pat's own wisdom, but to walk in the strength and the wisdom and the power and the life of the Spirit of God. So guess what, guys? I've come here thousands of times with this truth because I run up every day to the fact God's not telling me be a good Christian for Jesus. God's called me to be a miracle every day and let Jesus live through me. So this has encouraged me as I've walked, I come there and I lock my eyes on Jesus because here's Pat Peglo and right up here are as high as my resources go. 
Okay, this is as high as my smarts go, and this is as far as my resource go. But my problem is this big, and I don't have what it takes. But guess what? When I turn my face from my problem, and I put it upon a God who's not only this high up, not only at the ceiling, but according to scriptures, as high as the highest heavens, whose power and smarts go just infinitely beyond anything I face. Guess what, guys? When I lock myself on Jesus, that's a whole different story. That's what this passage is calling us to do. That's the point of this passage. You know, I've shared with you before, I've struggled with depression. And I was in the midst of a um, long one and a deep one. Three years long for various reasons. I, I've shared before in sermons about this, the whole sermons on it, depression, but I want, I want to encourage you with one thought that came to me. During this depression, I talked to friends. I talked to counselors. I read books about emotional health and depression. I, I listened to tapes, you know. I, I, I went to group sessions, you know. I, 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 I did all these things, but somehow I still couldn't figure out what was going on in my life, and I, it just none of those seemed to work to fix it. And God brought this verse to my attention during this season. Light arises in the darkness for the upright. You know what he's saying here? God will cause for his people Right out of the darkness, a light to shine. <laughs> and you know what, guys? That's what I held on to now. Is God, I need you. I've been looking at all these people and hoping they'd help and I get all this wisdom. I need you to bring to the light what I need now. Listen to what Isaiah says. Another passage God has used in my life. Who, among you, who is among you that fears the Lord, that obeys the voice of his servant, that walks in darkness and has no light. Guess what? Those are good guys. Those are guys walking with God. Those are guys that fear God and obey his word. They're saying, you know what? And yet they're still in the darkness. They don't have the light. Just walking with God, is, God isn't a guarantee that you're going to have what it takes to face this. So what's he say? This is what, let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. You don't know what to do? Lock your eyes on Jesus. He'll bring you the light that you need. Then he brings in the next verse. Behold all you who kindle a fire, who encircle yourselves with firebrands, walk in the light of your fire, and among the brands you have set ablaze. You know what he's saying here? These are guys that are in the dark, and they don't know what to do, so guess what? They're going out and studying their own fire brands. They're finding sticks, and they're putting the thing on the end, and they're putting the oil there, and they're lighting the fire. Now they're starting, they're putting up all their own lights. And they're trying to figure this thing out themselves, and they're bringing all their own light together. You know what God says to them? You know what you get from my hand? You'll lay down in torment. You're just going to find more trouble. This isn't where you're going to find what you need. You know, um... When, when I, uh, I'm sorry, I got, I got a lot of things I want to say that aren't in my notes. <laughs> so I'm trying to figure out, okay, Lord, where do they come in and where, where do they not? But uh, when I think of this particular passage and these things, oh, I know what I was going to say. I, I read a statement from just the other day from a guy called Mark Batterson. It was tips for leaders. And he said this. He said, one God idea is better than a thousand of man's best ideas. Did you hear that? One God idea is better than a thousand of man's best ideas because of this. Because a God idea has the power to change the course of your life. It has the power to change history. It has the power to change your family. It has the power to change a church. 
So we can walk around with all our own firebrands and our thousands of good ideas and our best practices and all the things we can learn, or we can seek God for something that comes from God that can change the whole direction of my life. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying here that we don't step into the resources God has given us. God has given us groups to help us through things. God has given us books. God has given us friends. God has given us counselors. So don't misunderstand me saying we don't do it, but let, I get, we got to keep these things in perspective. There's sources and there's resources. God is the source of light that I need that doesn't come from my resources that gives me thousands of man's best ideas. But what happens is, is that as I trust God and I step into these resources he's put into my life, I'm trusting God that through one of those resources, he's going to raise up a light in the darkness. It might be through a counselor. It might be through a book. It might be through a song. Guys, it might be in my sleep because he says what he gives to his beloved even in their sleep. So don't misunderstand Pat saying, well, you just trust God and do nothing. No, but you know what? We do something, but my trust is not in the resource. My trust is in the source. And that the source, through the resources or apart from the resources, will give me what I need. You know, 2020 has been an overwhelming year uh, for many people, and I felt it different ways, and we all have our own experience of what we've had. And I remember that during the season, I, I picked up a devotion, well, just a short thing, I don't even know how I came across it, but uh, J David Jeremiah said this, are you focusing on your problems and acknowledging Jesus? Or are you focusing on Jesus and acknowledging your problems? That's what this passage is talking about, guys. Flipping it upside down, turning my attention and my face away from my problems, and this is the focus of my life, and this is everything that's filling my heart and my mind, and turning an attention and focusing upon Jesus while I'll acknowledge the reality of those problems, my face is turned towards Jesus as I rely upon him. And so a question we got to ask ourselves, where's my face? Where's my mind? Where's my heart in these days? And, you know, it was interesting because when I read this devotional, my, my face was caught in the things I was wrestling with. And when I confessed that, it's amazing. The problems didn't change. They didn't go away, but my heart changed. And I found freedom, and I found joy, and I found peace as I kept on walking. And I just want to say this. I'm going to make a couple applications today to COVID. Um, here's the first one. And if you get offended by this or you say, man, to this, just wait because I got another one that comes that will probably offend others. So I'm an equal opportunity pastor. Give everybody a chance to be offended. But here's this first one is this. There's some people whose focus and face is in COVID-19. It's all they can think about. First thing in the morning, they wake up and they're looking on the internet to see what's the latest statistics, what's the latest report, what's the latest wisdom out there, what's the latest whatever this. Waiting for our 18, how, you know, I, I, in my mind, I'm, I'm not going to go into that, but our 18 on channel two. And, uh, you know, it, it kind of started that when COVID came. And all of a sudden, it's, in my mind, it's a very dramatic way to get people. Start every week with the news about COVID, every, every day. News of COVID, how many cases have been tested, how many have been positive, how many have died, and all the talk and everything. And so the first thing that everybody's focusing upon right now is COVID-19. And there's people that are... I had a woman come up to me afterwards and after she says, Pat, thanks for what she, I'm one of those people. I get up first thing in the morning, I'm on the internet checking on COVID. 
And you know what, guys? If that's what we're doing, we're going to be like Jehoshaphat before he turned his face to God, and we're going to be full of fear. And we're going to be afraid. And our life is going to be driven, and our decisions are going to be driven by fear. And so we've got to really ask myself, is my focus on COVID, and am I just acknowledging God during this time? Or is my focus upon God and acknowledging the reality of COVID. That's what this passage is talking about. That's how it applies to you and me today. And so let's look at the second point we learn in this text. Because uh, what happened was this. Let me catch up where I'm at here. Here's the second thing that happened. We learned from this text. Praise and thank God in the middle of the battle. In the middle of the battle. Now let me tell you what I mean by that. I'm not saying wait till the battle's done and then I thank and praise God that he did something. He's saying praise God right in the middle of the battle. Look at what happened here. What what happened is, is the next thing is they finish praying and they're standing in the presence of the Lord and, and uh, they're waiting upon the Lord. All of a sudden, God stirs one of the Levites and listen to what he says in verse 15. He said, listen, all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not fear or be dismayed because of this great multitude. The battle is not yours, but God's. Verse 17, you need not fight in this battle. Station yourselves, stand and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out to face them, for the Lord is with you. This encourages them. Guys, we've been focused on God. God just gave us a word. You're not going to have to fight this one. I'll take care of it. And then the next morning, Jehoshaphat got up early in verse 20, said this, they rose, rose up early in the morning and went out to the wilderness of Tekoa. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, listen to me, O Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem. Put your trust in the Lord, your God, and you will be established. Put your trust in his prophets and succeed. I want to say something about trust right now and faith because this is locking your eyes on Jesus. This is trusting God and we're going to see an expression of the trusting by praising in the middle of the battle. But he tells them here to put your trust in God in his word. What came through the prophets? God's word. Where did God's, the Bible come from? The prophets, God's word. We have God's word now and the instruction that we can learn from this and what a mature faith has is there's two pillars to faith. We trust the person of God and we trust the word of God. Now I'm not gonna go there but if you go back and look at this prayer and it'll be well worth your time spending some time in it this week. You're gonna see that's exactly what Jehoshaphat did in this prayer because how does he start his prayer? He says, God, didn't you give this land to us? And now these guys are coming to try to take it away. He's referring back to Genesis 12 and 15 where God made a covenant with Israel and said, I'm going to give you this land and it's going to be yours forever. So he's referring back to what God has already promised and given them. But then he turns to another promise. Well, first one wasn't a promise, it's a fact. It's established, it's done what God's already given them. Some was a promise because you know what he does then in the prayer? He says, God, didn't you say if we run into trouble, if we turn our face towards your temple, towards this house, and we cry out to you that you will hear and you'll answer. So Jehoshaphat's faith and Jehoshaphat's trust and Jehoshaphat's prayer was based upon God's word, not just what he wanted in his heart. And you know, guys, we just went through Ephesians. We learned a lot of things about what we have in Jesus. Are you claiming those in prayer before God? God, you already given me this. Lord, didn't you say this is mine? And then he turns to some of the promises. And I'm just wondering, how well do you know what God has given you in his promises? 
We need to saturate ourselves with this book because we are spiritual millionaires and many of us are living like paupers. Paup yeah, that's right, paupers because we're not doing that. So the first thing we need to recognize is that a mature faith trust in both God and his word. Abraham's the beautiful example of this in Romans chapter four. Remember the promise to Abraham? He was near 100 years old and his wife uh, was 90 and she'd been barren all her life and God promised him you're gonna have a child. In fact, you're not just gonna have a child, you're gonna be the father of many nations. And this is what he said, without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb, yet with respect to the promise of God. He did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured that what God had promised he was able to perform. He trusted in the person of God to be able to carry out the word of God that he promised he would do. And a mature faith doesn't just grab verses and, and trust the verse, trust the God who spoke it. And a mature faith doesn't just trust God with what's in my heart and what I want. It's based upon what God has said in his word. But there's another thing to mature faith. And that is, is that mature faith is balanced out by God's word. Now, listen to me. This is my chance to offend some others that maybe weren't first time. It's really not my heart. What I'm going to say, I'm not preaching against anybody because what I'm going to say, I've heard from numerous people, both inside and outside of Moraine. I've seen it all over Facebook. I've seen it, I've heard it just in all kinds of places. But a mature faith really balances God's word. George Verwer said this, founder of Mercy Ships. He said it from this pulpit. I was here when he said it, actually. He said, a balanced Christian is not one who's learned how to live with one foot in the world and one foot in the church. A balanced Christian is somebody that knows how to handle the tensions of Scripture. They know how to take the full counsel of God's word and balance that out and not just grab one verse and hang on that. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not a big proponent and I'm not impressed by the many who are saying kind of, uh, they put up on their Facebook, they're wearing their shirts, and they're called faith over fear. And the message is like, you know, if you just trusted God, you know, you wouldn't be so afraid. And often, I've heard it said, kind of those people who are wearing masks and social distancing are people are full of fear and they just need to trust God. And matter of fact, we had somebody come over, we invited over, Kim and I did, and they responded to us just, yes, you're not gonna come because, uh, because of the COVID concerns, and they had that. And they said, you probably think I'm a weakling. And I said, we don't think you're a weakling. I respect everybody's decisions for whatever reason they have to make them. And so there's many who have, in the Christian faith who have been made to feel like weaklings because they don't have enough faith to trust God and, and the fact that he'll take care of them here. You need to know this. Satan is the master of one truth. What did he do when he approached Jesus? He said, he quoted God's word. And then what did Jesus did? He quoted back God's word to balance out what he said. Beautiful example. He said, he said Jesus, jump off the pinnacle of this temple because he said in Psalm 91, he gave his angels to you to protect you and they'll guard everything. So jump off and because God said he will protect you. What did Jesus say? You don't test the Lord your God. He balanced out scripture. Guys, I don't have the luxury as a pastor, and many of you really as mature Christians don't have the luxury to pull out one truth without balancing it out with the rest of scripture. And yet so many Christians are doing that in this day. Proverbs says this, that the um, prudent man sees trouble and he hides himself. 
You see, this is the kind of faith I want to have. A faith that's balanced out by scripture, a faith that says it doesn't live for itself, as, as um, Philippians 2 said, consider others as more important than myself, talks about the gentleness of dealing with those who are weak or are struggling. What's wrong with a faith that says, I want to have a faith that is balanced by scripture? I want to have a faith that's full of love? I want to have a faith that's full of wisdom? And I'm going to say this, guys, because I'm not sure the issue is faith versus fear. Maybe the issue is wisdom versus foolishness. Because if God's word says that all of these are true rather than just one of them, and I'm just going to grab onto one truth, and that's all I'm going to live off of, and that's all I'm going to tell people, I'm going to make everybody else feel bad because they don't go my way. Guys, I just don't think that's the kind of faith that the scripture talks about. A mature faith has got the ability to take all the truth of God's word and live with the tensions of it and live in light of that. And that's the kind of faith Jehoshaphat had. He had a faith that was based upon not just what God said he gave me, what God promised, the truth of God's word. And so I just want to encourage Moraine Valley Church that we can be a people who live with faith say God is sovereign and he is in control. And I believe that. And yet St. Thomas have a faith that's wise and respects what's going on and walks with caution. And I'm going to have a faith that's going to love other people. And if that's what it takes for them to be comfortable around me, then I'm going to put a mask on. So this is the kind of faith that's important for us as believers to have, a complete faith. And then look at what happened. It's amazing what happened next. When he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who sang to the Lord and those who praised him in holy attire, and they went out before the army and gave thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness is everlasting. And when they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes. Guys, we need to learn to praise God in the middle of the battle. Don't wait till it's done. Then God will thank and praise you. But right there, right up front, as they're getting ready to go out, the worshipers were lined up before the warriors. And God began to set ambushes when they began to praise him. It's true. A melody is our weapon. It's a weapon that God's put in our hands. And when we're in battles that are bigger than we're strong and smarter than we're smart, one of the best places to start is by getting on my knees and worshiping and praising God and exalting him and seeing a God who's bigger than what's going on and watch him begin to work as we begin to praise him. You know, more than once I found myself in intense battles in the soul. Yeah, some of them I know, the enemy was just working overtime on me. And I remember one night in particular, and I, I couldn't sleep, and I got out of bed, and just the turmoil was going on in my soul, and I'm like, whoa. And I, many of you in small groups have got this card. What is truth, and who am I, and who we, what we have in Christ? I had a card similar to this. It was old, this was a longer time before we made these, but on one side it said who we are in Christ, the other side what we have in Christ. And I remember going down in the front room, and I got down on my knees, and I started to pray one truth at a time, where I started to thank and praise God that this was true of me. And guys, I got halfway down the front side. Guess what? My heart was free. My peace returned. Joy was in my soul. A song was singing in the depths of my being. Because you know what, guys? I used praise as a weapon. And when I started to praise, God ambushed the enemy in my life. And it returned my joy and my perspective in my mind. It's happened many, many times. It's a weapon that we don't use, we need to. So as we go to communion, I want you to ask these questions. If you didn't grab a uh, packet, they're right by the entryway. 
First of all, are you focusing upon Jesus and acknowledging your problems, or are you focusing on your problems and acknowledging Jesus? Question we have to ask ourselves. Second one is this. When is the last time I praise Jesus in the middle of the battle rather than afterwards? Maybe this morning needs to be that time. Because you know what? We can praise and thank Jesus for what the cross means to my life and my trials. Guys, you stop. I mean, we can meditate on that for a week. Because of what Jesus did at the cross when he shed his blood, how does that impact my life today? And how does that impact the trials that I have? So take a few moments to meditate on that. And then Josh will lead us in communion.